On May 8, 1945, Europe saw the end of a prolonged and gruesome war. However, peace had yet to come to all corners of the world. Far to the east, the war still raged in the Pacific, and the Japanese seemed unyielding, even when the Allies were slowly retaking one island at a time. Soon, the time came to plan a direct assault on the enemy's home islands, but drawing from previous experiences, the US foresaw the fighting would stretch into 1946. Before the secret atomic bomb was considered to subdue the Japanese, the US Navy devised a plan of classic coastal naval bombardments aimed at dismantling the nation's industry. Throughout July and August, the Allied fleets harassed many Japanese ports relentlessly, but they never expected how successful their attacks would be. The island hopping campaign in the Pacific had been costly for the US forces, but as 1944 came to an end, the Japanese expansion had been checked. In November, the Americans captured the Mariana Islands and secured several air bases to bomb mainland Japan. Meanwhile, the last Japanese Navy strongholds were wiped out at Leyte Gulf and off the Philippines after many years of oppression for the people and the prisoners of war. Early the following year, US Marines assaulted Iwo Jima, which stood between the Marianas and Japan, ensuring yet another staging post for the bombers. The next step was to capture Okinawa, which gave way to an onslaught of shells, rockets and bombs from no less than 1,300 ships, including the British Pacific Fleet. Even so, the Japanese staged a fierce defence against the 3,000 sorties of fighter bombers taking off from 40 aircraft carriers. In addition, 10 battleships and 9 cruisers pummeled the island with 13,000 shells. By April 1st, four US divisions landed on Okinawa, kicking off a bitter war of attrition for 486 square miles of land. The defenders were hidden underground, and it took the Americans three months to seize the entire territory. Although the Japanese counterattacked twice, their efforts were futile, and they eventually succumbed to the more powerful US military. Nevertheless, the operation required 170,000 US servicemen and cost 8,000 American lives. The end of the war was within reach, but the hardships endured at Okinawa now raised questions about the feasibility of a direct attack on the Japanese home islands. The US Navy wanted to block and bomb Japan to make it collapse. General Douglas MacArthur and the army wanted to attack Kyushu early to get ready for invading the main island, Honshu. Admiral Chester Nimitz agreed. This led to Operation Downfall happening in two parts. First, Operation Olympic would attack Kyushu in November. Then, Operation Coronet would invade Honshu in March 1946. In Okinawa, 35% of the troops were casualties. So, for the Kyushu assault, 767,000 troops were planned. The Japanese High Command had a big defense plan called Ketsu Go, with three million soldiers to break American morale. The US Army Air Forces attacked Japanese cities and industries from the Marianas in 1945. Allied submarines and ships blocked Japanese trade routes. Fuel shortages kept Japanese Navy ships at bay, and the air service had to keep planes in reserve, expecting a big Allied attack. The Allied naval commanders decided to bomb Japanese coastal cities from battleships to make Japan surrender before using atomic bombs. On July 1st, the US Third Fleet left Leyte Gulf in the Philippines led by Admiral William Halsey. Their goal was to directly attack Japan. First, the Navy sent submarines to Japan's coastal waters to look for naval mines. At the same time, the US Army Air Forces sent B-29 Super Fortresses and B-24 Liberators to take pictures over Japan to find airfields and facilities. Task Force 38 was given the job of carrying out the first attacks. Under Vice Admiral John McCain's command, the task force sent out aircraft on July 10th to hit facilities around Tokyo. On the 14th, TF-38 sailed north to attack Hokkaido and northern Honshu. 
These areas hadn't been targeted before in the war because they were out of the range of US bombers. This was Japan's first naval attack in almost a century. The Americans faced little resistance, sinking 11 warships and 20 merchant ships. They damaged eight warships and 21 merchant ships, and they said they destroyed at least 25 Japanese aircraft, TF-38, then sent a bombardment group called Task Unit 34421, led by Rear Admiral John F. Shafroth Jur. This unit went to Kamaichi in northern Honshu to destroy a Crucial Ironworks, one of Japan's largest. At 11 a.m., the battleship South Dakota raised a flag that said, never forget Pearl Harbor. The Japanese defenses were expected to respond to the bombardments with their aircraft held in reserve. However, the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters anticipated this and decided not to attack the naval forces in Japan to avoid exposing their last resources. They were awaiting a major landing operation. Around noon on the 14th, the task unit began bombarding the Japan Iron and Steel Corporation factory, which was the first Allied bombardment of a Japanese coastal town. Even so, they never crossed the 100 fathom line, as no minesweepers were available to clear the area. The force pummeled the factory with 802 410 mm shells, 728 200 mm shells, and 825 130 mm shells. Most of the shells fell within ironworks grounds, but the concussion from the explosions set the entire town ablaze. Despite the thick curtain of smoke that significantly impeded vision, the US Navy fired accurately on predetermined targets. And yet, there was no Japanese response. As Time magazine described, for two hours the guns roared and their shell bursts walked through the steel plant. The Jap reply from shore batteries was only a whispered echo. The sacred soil of Japan, from which the kamikaze, divine wind, was supposed to disperse all attackers, had been violated. That same night, the attacks continued on Mururan, on the southeast coast of Hokkaido. Another bombardment unit, TU-34.8.2, raided the Japan Steel Company's plant and the Wanishi Ironworks. Then, the following morning, three battleships battered the city, inflicting considerable damage to the industrial facilities and the urban structures. Accompanying his sailors from USS Missouri, Halsey acknowledged that his fleet was vulnerable to aerial attacks. And as he later remembered, those six hours were the longest of his life. In late July, relentless assaults pounded Japanese coastal towns, crippling their remaining navy. However, an invasion still seemed inevitable to end the war. A detailed New York Times report suggested waning fear of Japanese intelligence, hinting at confidence in Allied progress. On July 26th, a stark ultimatum arrived. The Potsdam Declaration demanded Japan's unconditional surrender or face utter destruction. Undeterred, Japan seemed to reject the terms. President Truman, facing a seemingly endless war, authorized the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Even after Hiroshima's devastation, the proud empire held on. Three days later, Nagasaki witnessed another atomic blast. Simultaneously, the Soviets invaded Manchuria, tightening the noose around Japan. Finally, on August 10th, the emperor bowed to the inevitable, accepting unconditional surrender as outlined in Potsdam. Allied forces faced a typhoon and resupply needs, briefly pausing the offensive in late July and early August. However, on the day of Nagasaki's bombing, another attack targeted aircraft concentrations in northern Honshu, boasting the destruction of 712 planes. Further complicating the picture, Allied intelligence misjudged the damage to Kameshi's ironworks, leading to a redundant bombardment. Newly arrived ships, including heavy cruisers and light cruisers from various Allied nations, joined the fray. Despite some Japanese resistance, the relentless bombardment continued for two hours. By this point, resistance was futile. Japan capitulated the next day, and after negotiations, the Emperor formally surrendered on August 14th marking the official end of both the Pacific War and World War II. Thank you for watching.